next was peer reviewed by Professor Baron Bum. So I'd like to thank you for that. Sorry? Okay, I've now cut, I've now cut uh, two minutes out of Conrad's speech for which I apologise. So, uh, without any further ado, and before I say any more of what Conrad was going to say, uh, I'd like to call on Conrad to officially introduce our guest speaker, Conrad. Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome and to introduce to you Michael Berenbaum, a de Jong, a world authority in the studies of Holocaust and Jewish studies. And I must admit, a friend of mine who some lengthy years ago played a vital role in my academic career. This is his second visit to Sydney and to the Sydney Jewish Museum when he turned out 17 years ago. We were all still residing or working in the bunker. And then he tried, although he doesn't recall that anymore, to obtain a very memorable item from us, namely the famous cookbook from a survivor in Ravensburg. But we refused to hand this over to him. <laughs> I can also reveal again what you said before. Um, he reviewed and censored all our historical text for the new, if not exciting or brilliant, new exhibition on the Holocaust. And you will later understand why we ask him. As you will soon hear, Michael is an American born in New Jersey, to be more precise, in Newark, close to New York's second largest airport, graduating in arts and receiving an ordination as Orthodox rabbi at the age of 23. He embarked on an academic career, teaching at numerous universities, top universities, such as Florida State University, Yale, Georgetown, Wesleyan, uh, Maryland, and the American University in the American Jewish University in LA, Los Angeles. He still teaches, this time in his capacity as professor of Jewish studies at the American Jewish University in LA. He can point to an impressive list of publications and projects. He is the author and editor of 22 books, among them pioneering, groundbreaking studies, such as The World Must Know, The Autonomy of Auschwitz Death Camp, The Holocaust and History, The Known, The Unknown, The Disputed, and The Reexamined. Furthermore, he was the executive editor of the second edition of the new Encyclopedia Judaica. He served as president of the Spielberg Survivors Visual Foundation in LA, a depository of some 52,000 testimonial accounts of survivors, and you can access at least 2,500 here at our muse museum, those testimonial accounts recorded by survivors who rebuilt their lives down under. Furthermore, his work in film has earned him awards as executive producer, producer, and historical consultant. And last but not least, and Norman has already pointed this out, Professor Birnbaum played a vital role in the establishment of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, first as deputy director of the President's Commission on the Holocaust, and then as director of the Holocaust Memorial's Research Center. I think there is hardly any Holocaust museum around the globe which has not sought your advice. Am I right? <laughs> Before I ask you to present the Matilda Simons Memorial Lecture, 
I would like to say a few words about Matilde Simons. Her maiden name was Matilde Raveden. Raveden? Raveden? Either. Either. One of 11 children of Tobias and Fanny Raveden. She was born in England after her parents had escaped the programs in Latvia and they settled down in England. Her father, Tobias, was a tailor who settled in the East End of London and left England in the early 60s with his family to rebuild or to build up their life here in Sydney. She was a lifelong resident of Bondi until her death in 1998, aged 83. As the matriarch of the family, she was very proud of her Jewish roots. And I think she would have been very proud to learn that the lecture today is in honor of her name. And she was also, and this is what the grandson David told me, very proud when she heard that he was volunteering at the museum to become a guide. But unfortunately, the application went missing. We still have to check the reason for that, but David at least continued to be a great sponsor for the museum with donations and with memorabilia and a few of those collections which he is always obtaining you know, certain uh, endeavors uh, will be shown in the new exhibition. Um, next year he is embarking on a journey to Latvia, to Dvinsk or Daugapils, or in German Dunaburg, the second largest city of Latvia, where once one of the most important centers of Jewish culture in Eastern Europe was based, and a Jewish community which was wiped out by the um, German and by the Latvian genocidal killers. And if I'm not mistaken, two alleged war criminals who found refuge in Australia and who were investigated by us took part in the liquidation of the ghetto of Dünaburg. You might have heard the names Konrad Kallius and Carlos Usolz. They were members of the Arias Commando, the infamous Latvian mobile killing unit, and they were uh, partly in charge of liquidating the family and the Jewish community of some 17,000 Jews in Dünaburg in 1942. And David, as so many others, are embarking on a journey to Latvia. He always did this in Poland, searching for roots, the German have a lovely word for this, historische Spurensuche, yeah? to search for the roots, for the remnants of their vanished, of their uh, destroyed families. And I have the privilege, had the privilege of accompanying to these journeys of uncovering yeah, the burial and murder sites of the Jews in Eastern Europe. Finally, I should like to thank you and your family um, for making the visit of Professor Barenbaum possible. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Barenbaum. Thank you, Conrad, for uh, an overly kind introduction. I'm happy my son went back because he would have asked for equal time. Um, my son and I enjoyed uh, several days in Sydney last week and uh, have come to appreciate the unique and singular beauty of this city. Uh, and we did the uh, bridge climb and we uh, visited your harbors and your beaches, and um, we thought it would be summer, but you're down under. 
Let me also say in my son's, uh, I'm going to say something in advance. This is uh, what we call in the United States an R-rated lecture, which is it is not made to, it, it is not going to sugarcoat anything, and it neither makes me comfortable to give it, nor should it make you comfortable to hear it, but it's something you have to uh, pay attention to because we're going to get to the center of the killing. My son, who's been attending a series of my lectures uh, with a little bit of coercion and a little bit of bribery, um, said, why didn't you give the lecture um, which I gave on, uh, and this relates to the cookbook, why didn't you give the lecture on Holocaust humor? Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit next time. So I said that what I would do to, and the reason for that is because we published a cookbook in Washington, a wonderful story, which is why we asked for the cookbook. In 1944, a woman died on Yom Kippur, and she said, um, to another woman, and she died in Tresnestad, if you survive, give this to my daughter, Anna Stern in Palestine. The woman arrived in Palestine. She came to, uh, and she never found an Anna Stern in Palestine. 22 years later, 23 years later, she's at a party in New York. She meets an Anna Stern from Prague, who was in Palestine in 44. And she says something which always gives me the chills, I have a present for you from your mother. What was the present? The present was essentially a collection of recipes by Central European women constructed in the concentration camp, the ghetto, the transit camp, who essentially dealt with starvation by recording what for them was their history and their history revolved around the kitchen and food. Make a long story short, um, we published the cookbook and then we came up with what for me was not a marketing tool but a commandment, which as I said, you have to make two promises if you buy the cookbook, otherwise don't buy it. One is that you will make something from the cookbook for simcha, for a joyous occasion. And the other is that you'll tell the story, because these women suffered enough, and having suffered enough, they should be present at joyous occasions. It then came out after we published it that in 10 different camps, women had created cookbooks, that part of material culture for them, preserving memory in the same way that you had Ringelblum creating archives, you had women uh, creating recipes. Interestingly enough, none of the recipes were complete because you always need a kitchen. You always need a kitchen to be able to come with it, so we had to adjust some of the recipes. And turned out that there is a new film that is an international film about how women in oppression, it's called Imaginary Feasts, how women in oppression deal with their starvation and it's essentially by the creation and the preservation of material culture. And for women of Central European origin, the material culture was food. The kitchen was the central thing. I was talking to somebody today. The Italian family and the Jewish family have identical ethnicities, namely, the father believes he's in charge and the mother rules the roost and the mother, nothing, nothing in life occurs that's not surrounded by bread and wine, and the single most important um, room in the house is the kitchen. So my son said to me, before I give this lecture, I have to tell you the other um, thing, which is a little bit of Holocaust humor. So let me only, as a transition before we get too serious, um, Three Jews, and humor was one of the other ways that Jews survived. It's always a tool of the oppressed, and it's always the tool by which the oppressed get uh, a certain sense of power. 
two jokes. Three men sit down and one says, oi. The other says, oi, oi. And the third says, oi, oi, oi. And the guy says, we've talked enough about politics. <laughs> That may not be a joke in the United States. <laughs> Let's now, so in honor of my son who departed uh, yesterday, um, I've given you the joke. Uh, one more because I can't resist it. It's a joke from the Warsaw Ghetto. A child is asked, what would you want most of all if you were Hitler's son? He said, in Yiddish it will sein a yosem. I'd like to be an orphan. <laughs> and I ask you, as you think of that, if I gave you an hour, could you come up with a better answer? And the answer is probably not. And part of that tells you how humor dealt with it. But we're going to deal with the opposite of it now. Zinder Commando the special prisoner units that operate in the vicinity of the gas chambers were intimate with the act of killing. They observed the murderers and the act of killing directly, closely, and over a long period of time. They were in the presence of the condemned in the last moments when they entered the undressing room, when they lined up to go into the gas chamber and they were with the corpses. <coughs> Minutes after they were da gassed, when their bodies were removed from, uh, from the chambers and they were, quotation marks, processed. At Birkenau and elsewhere, Zunder Commando pulled gold teeth from the dead victim's mouth. They searched the inner cavities for hidden valuables. They removed rings from fingers and clipped hair, which was then bundled and shipped. They burnt the corpses either in open pits or in crematory ovens. They crushed the bones and they poured the accumulated ashes to the Vistula River, where they were deposited to flow mount downstream. One member of the Zunder Commando, Sam Itzkowitz, was born in Markov in Poland in 1924. He arrived in Auschwitz on December 10th, 1942, which meant he was at the age of 18. Soon after his, his arrival, he was selected to work in the vicinity of the Zunda Commando and could observe his surroundings. It was not work he chose, but a task imposed upon him. And we have to say that nobody volunteered for the Zunder Commando, but it was a task imposed upon him. He was not alone in contemplating suicide shortly after he began his work. When asked, did you think of going to the electrified barbed wires surrounding the camp, Itzkowitz replied, plenty of time. I didn't have the guts. I kept on thinking to myself, I wish I had the guts to do it. I just didn't, couldn't get myself together to do it. Death was certainly easier and simpler than the life he was to live. The temptation to commit suicide did not easily pass. Another Zunder commando, David Nansel, described one moment when he opted to die. I took an elderly woman in my hands and I was walking and crying and I threw her into the bunker there and I didn't go out. I felt that I was carrying my own mother in there. I didn't want to go out with something like it. I wanted to go with them together and be finished. But he was permitted no such choice. I want, I, before they locked the gas chamber door, they counted the prisoners, and they noticed one more than they had counted, and they recognized me, so they pulled me out. Yaakov Zilberberg was a Kohen, a member of the priestly tribe forbidden to desecrate its unique status by being in contact with the dead. He was a religious Jew, and thus prohibited from taking his own life, he offered a rationale. What benefit would there be if I committed suicide? Who would know what went on? He talked to a rabbi who also served as a Zunder commando, who was the Dayan, the judge, 
the rabbinic decisor of Makov. He told the Dayan, I'm going to the wires. The Dayan said to me, it would be a bigger sin if I kill myself than I should do this work. One adjusts, then I said, tomorrow morning I'll go to the electric fence. In the morning I began to think differently. It was difficult to live, but then you adjust. Repeating the Dayan's words, Silverberg said, for suicide there is always time. Suicide, as one person said, is the final solution to a temporary problem. Shol Chazan said, to kill yourself you need a reason. We had no reason to kill ourselves. The Germans were in charge. This is a critical point. In the undressing room they presided, they told the incoming Jews they were going to the shower and then to work. They instructed them to remember the hook upon which they hung their clothing so they could retrieve it afterwards. An SS men arriving in a Red Cross van would drop the gas. Sam Itzkovitz described the process of killing. A German doctor would come by after the gassing and pronounce the words, everything is finished. He would then leave again in a Red Cross vehicle. It was regarded as a medicalized process. And an interesting thing is that even in the Eichmann trial, 16 years after the Holocaust, the defense lawyer made a very interesting slip of the tongue. He said, we're talking about um, uh, killing and other medical issues. And the Israeli judge, all of whom spoke, um, spoke uh, German fluently, switched into German and said, we would normally call these acts of murders, why were they medical processes? And the defense lawyer Servadius said in a very quick and what I believe was in a, a, you know uh, was what we call in politics a um, a um, misstatement, which is when you tell the truth. Uh, he said they were done by doctors, therefore they were medical. And the judge himself was astounded and was silent for about two minutes to let that sink in. And the court of law to have silence for two minutes is an eternity and a half. So he said everything is finished. He would then leave in a, vis in a Red Cross vehicle. The description of death, and this again is not going to be easy. First the women had to go into the gas chamber. They led them in, packed them as tight as they could. Then the men had to go after that, and the chamber was filled to capacity. But they knew it was going to be filled, so they held back a lot of youngsters, boys and girls, they held them back. As the chamber was filled to capacity, the Zunder Commando had to grab kids by their legs and arms and shove them over the heads of people. of the victims in the gas chamber and kept poking them so they would go further. The screams of the victims that walked on was horrendous, but the kids had to move further until they got them all in and then they slammed the door and gave the signal to the SS man upstairs to put the gas in. He was asked, did the people know they were going to die? Itzkowitz replied, they knew. They knew, but they couldn't do anything. They were naked. They were one against the other. They had nowhere to go. You couldn't move an arm and leg. What can you do? Eliezer Eisenschmidt tried to allude to the fate that awaited his victim. Seeing the entire community about to be murdered, what he called liquidated, in the terms the Nazis deceptively used, he turned to a rabbi and he warned, warned say vidui, the final confession of the Jewish leader, liturgy with his congregation. The rabbi said, no, God will help us. We're going to see how some people said they saw no God, and the last thing they saw was help. Some Zunder commando were reticent to tell the prisoners what awaited them. 
I did not say the truth. What could I say that you're going to die? I'm thankful that I did not say the truth. Others presumed the prisoners knew their fate. Most of them knew they were doomed and there was nothing they could do about them and most of them did not believe somehow their human instinct is so strong that they see death in front of them and try to wipe it off. No, that cannot be, this cannot happen, but in reality they had to face it. Rudolf Redder has a unique stature among the Zunder Commando. He is one of only two known survivors of Belgitz. Let me say, Belgitz had 500,000 Jews murdered in 10 months. The entire Jewish communities of Galicia, all the Galicianas. And there were only two known survivors. And during that 10 months, the gas chambers were reorganized for a month and a half. So in reality, it was about eight and a half months in which there was killing. Approximately 500,000 Jews were murdered. Chaim Hertzman, Hirschman, the other known survivor, was killed on the day that he bore witness. And the only thing we have of his witness was his wife, who said, ever since my husband escaped Sobibor, uh, escaped Belgitz, he's been saying nothing else than what happened, allow me to give testimony even though it will not account and it will not count in a court of law. So Redder is literally the only survivor of Belgitz to tell his story. He was born on April 4, 1941, in Debitsa, Poland, and was thus more than 60 years of age when he worked in the Zunderkommando at Belgitz. A very mature man. He was educated as a chemist. He moved to Lvov in 1910, where he owned a soap factory. During the German occupation, he was incarcerated in the ghetto with his family. His daughter was a doctor in the Jewish hospital. The SS captured Redder during, Redder during the Gross Action of the 16th of August, 1942, meaning essentially five and a half or six months after Belgitz opened, and he was deported to Belgitz. Upon arrival, he was selected to work in the Zunderkommando, and there were very few people who arrived in Belgitz who were sent anywhere else other than to die. And he operated an excavator digging mass graves, and later he worked as a mason. Thanks to his job, he could move through the entire camp and bore witness to the entire uh, operation. His escape is an interesting escape. He was sent into the town of Lvov with two SS men accompanying him to get some supplies for the camp. Three rather attractive young ladies came by and flirted with the SS. Unclear whether they flirted with the SS deliberately to allow him to escape or they flirted with the SS. The SS, who were young men apart from any women, did what most young men do when they are flirted with with three lovely young ladies, which is they paid attention to the young ladies they did not pay attention to Redder. Redder looked around and saw no one blocking his path. He said, I'm going to die anyway. I might as well run away. He ran away. His Polish was fluent. And he hid through the end of the occupation with his former worker who had hit him. He moved together with his wife to Krakow in 45. He lived there until 1950. He immigrated to Israel and then to Canada. His date and place of death are unknown. His brief narrative was taken in 1946 and has a vividness not found in many later testimonies. One of the things that those of you who worked on the Shoah Foundation, and Conrad and I were talking about it earlier today, is that there is a difference between early testimonies and later testimonies. Early testimonies tend to be um, much less restrained and much more powerful because the people bearing testimony very often relive the experience and they haven't developed what we call a preferred narrative. And the preferred narrative are the story that you want to tell about the experience you've lived. 
which often means that you've repeated it several times and you've gotten it down so that you understand it. There's a rawness to the original testimony, a rawness and originalness and a power. And oftentimes also, especially, and this is not to minimize what we've collected, oftentimes the early testimonies were often given in the language in which they were experienced. And you will see, those of you who have worked with this testimony, you will see that um, people make very simple um, statements that are translations. For example, uh, the SS officer turned to me and said, stop. There's a difference between he uh, said to me, stop, and he said to me, halt. There's a difference in the language. There's a difference in the power of the language. And he said, he described the unique tension between knowing and not knowing. The victims went back and forth between hope and despair. Knowledge of awaited them and a willingness to be deceived. It began on the train. No one was talking to anyone. No one was consoling, lamenting women. No one was stopping, sobbing children. We all knew we were going to certain death and horrible death at that. Primo Levi reports a similar dread on the train. Now in the hour of decision, we said to each other things that are never said among the living. We said farewell, and in short, everyone said farewell to his life through his neighbor. Upon arrival, Redder described the tension between hope and despair. Listen carefully because you're going to get the sense of the shifting of mood. Immediately after the victims were unloaded, they were gathered in the courtyard surrounded by Amar scars for Ehrman to give a speech. Ehrman was the commandant. The silence was deadly. He stood close to the crowd. Everybody wanted to hear. Suddenly there was hope. If they talk to us, maybe they want us to live. Maybe there will be work. Maybe. Ehrman talked loud and clear. You're going now to bathe. Later you'll be sent to work. That's all. Everybody was glad, happy that after all they will be working. They even applauded. The men went straight ahead to a building with a side bath and inhalation rooms. The women proceeded 20 more meters to a large barracks about 30 by 15 meters to have their heads shaved. They entered quietly, not knowing what to expect. Silence was everywhere. After a few minutes, they were made to line up and made to sit on wooden stools eight at a time. When eight Jewish barbers entered and silently like automated figures, and you're going to hear the word automated again and again and again, started to shave off hair completely to the skin with shaving machines, that's when they realized the truth. They had no doubts then. Everybody, young and old, children, women, everybody went to certain death. Little girls with long hair were herded onto shaving barracks. Those with short hair went to the barracks with the men. Suddenly, without a transition from hope to despair, came the realization there was no hope. People began to scream, women became hysterical crazed. There were efforts to deceive Jews. Ehrman's speech, the SS telling the victims to remember where the clothing was hung, even officers swearing in the name of Hitler that, we would return, that they would return from the shower. Certain tasks were restricted to the Germans. They alone decided who shall live and who shall die. They alone placed gas in the gas chamber. They alone declared the dead dead. That was not given over to anyone else. It wasn't even given over to the people who assisted the Germans in some of the Aksion Reinhardt camps, namely the Ukrainians who staffed the major Aksion Reinhardt camps. The personal situation, uh, at Auschwitz, the work was long, 12-hour shifts were the norm. The personal situation of Zunder Commando was paradoxical, surely compromised. 
As long as transports continued to arrive, the Zunder Commando were needed. When they were needed, they were kept alive. When the arrival of transport slowed, however, they were the most vulnerable, the first to be killed, because they were the most dangerous eyewitnesses to the killing process. When did the resistance of the Zunder Commando at Auschwitz break out? In October 1944. Why in October 1944, by then the transports were slowing down? By then the gassing was coming to an end. It ended in November. And it's only then that the Zunder Commando understood that they were next. And armed resistance was never a decision how to live. It was a decision what statement to make with the fact that you're going to die. And that gave you a certain type of freedom once you no longer expected to live. Gidon Graef's masterful collection of Zunder Commando, as well as still unpublished ones that I've read from, some of which overlap with Graef's material, find recurring themes of self-justification. How do you live with yourself in the aftermath of this? I had no choice. The excuse, the statement is technically incorrect, but psychologically potent. For indeed, there were choices. What is remarkable is the sense of battle between conscience and life, as well as the ability within the Zunda Commando to shut down their feelings and to acclimate to their routine. Let's listen to various Zunda Commandos describe what they did. They speak of having no choice. You went along and did not have a choice. You went along under the pressure of beatings. Like I said, a person adjusts. You had no choice. We continued like that. Even I did not think for a moment that we were going to leave from here. For a moment, we did not think we would live to see. I had no choice, and I lied. There was nothing wise about it. We knew we had no choice. It was either commit suicide or go with them and do what you have to do. Again, Redder is authoritative, but not alone in his, relection, in his recollection of the emotions that had to be denied. How did it feel to be in this atmosphere, Redder was asked. When the barracks locked down for the night and the lights were out, one could hear a whisper of prayers for the dead. The Kaddish, the Kel Malay Rachamim, and then there was silence. We did not complain. We were completely resigned. We moved like automated figures, just one large mass of them. We just mechanically worked through our horrible existence. Only when I heard children calling, Mommy, haven't I been good? It's dark. My heart would break. But later we stopped having feelings. Words recur. Notice a pattern, robot, automa automaton, mechanized living. Feelings were shut down and anesthetized. When Zunder Commando were asked how did it feel, they responded, no more feelings. For one thing, I said to someone, I don't remember that I was no longer a human being. I couldn't cry. So this tells me that everything is dead inside. I'm not a human being like a kind of robot. Another one, I was very afraid, worried, stressed. You didn't have enough time to think about it. You just went like robots. Another, no, I was then not a human. I told you I was not a human. I could not cry. I could not think like a robot. Human being entered a certain routine, and you already worked like a robot. Robert J. Lifton, in his enduring book, Nazi Doctors, speaks of a psychological phenomenon of doubling. Doubling is a very interesting psychological phenomenon. It means that you are one self in one place and another self in another place. One of the best examples of doubling are physicians. Physicians who deal with death routinely, with death and with illness, who have to remove cancerous tumors, who have to tell parents of young children that they are not going to live and everything else, develop a certain self 
that is anesthetized and removed from it. Ironically, when it's their children, they feel just as much as anybody else. And when physicians become patients, they're often the worst type of patients imaginable. But doubling is a way in which you create a certain self that is unique to the place and a different self that is elsewhere. The strategy was not limited to the killers. It may have also been common to their victims. One of the things that you hear from the victims, and by the way, we have to reject when we hear this, they say that world was not our world. That was a world apart. That was planet Auschwitz. And the reason we have to reject it is because, uh, uh, and let me make it for you vividly. The beginning of Nazi doctors, Robert J. Lifton has a discussion with a survivor. The survivor turns out was Elie Wiesel, but he doesn't reveal the name in that, in that position. The survivor says, tell me, Bob, were they human when they did what they did? And Bob answered him, he said, not only were they were human, but they were doctors, and that's the reason I'm studying them. I'm studying them because they were human, and I'm studying them because they were doctors. And Wiesel, of blessed memory in his own inimical style, said it is demonic that they were not demonic. But methodologically, I believe that the only way to approach all of them is to approach them as human beings, and that's much more frightening than regarding them as demonic. Methodologically, we have to see them that way. Because they dealt with death, it was inevitable that religious questions were asked. Death pushes toward the absolute, either God or away from God. The Zunder Commando gathered on Yom Kippur 1944, 5705, on the Jewish calendar. They scavenged everything that was needed, including Machzorim and two Torahs. And how did Torahs arrive in Auschwitz? Ask yourself the question. Torahs arrived in Auschwitz because if you had a family Torah and you were deported and you didn't know where you were going, this is one of the items that you brought with you. And therefore Auschwitz had plenty of Torahs that arrived in Auschwitz and they were able to scavenge it. They were left alone to pray on the evening of Kol Nidre, then they went to work in the morning. They observed the Passover Seder, celebrating the miraculous exodus of the ancient Israelites from Egypt. Matzah, the unleavened bread, were baked. And the entire history of exile, one cannot imagine a place of exile so complete, where the matzahs that were baked were baked in the crematoria ovens. And I'm sorry for being this direct, but the only way to gather with this material is to understand and imagine for a moment telling the story of the Exodus in such a place. Sam Itzkovich was blunt as to the impact of his work on his faith. When asked, do you feel the presence of God of all those dead souls, he replied, do you believe there were souls? I didn't see any. Once you close your eyes, you're dead. All that malarkey, they're not going to come back when the Messiah comes. Please don't hold your breath. He became insistent, almost defiant. I lost my faith right then and there because I saw, you know, when I saw people bother, bother, die, it bothered me. But that wasn't too bad. When I saw innocent children, babies being thrown into the fire like Clinton would, that I kept hollering, why do those children born if you wanted to dispose of them in this kind of way? What have these innocent souls done to you? Why do they have to suffer an agonizing death? This is what broke me away from it. I didn't see any explanation. I didn't see any miracles. I didn't see anything. He asked a difficult question. What's the use? Where is justice? Where was God? I didn't have faith. Others maintained their faith. 
Itzkovitz observed, one day I was in the crematorium. This is the scene that makes it into the son of Saul. One day I was in the crematoria. I see a middle-aged man, very lean, very skinny, going up to the door where they were pulling out dotty, bodies and mature bodies. The big bodies couldn't be picked up, so they were heavy. So the command up went up and put a buckle on the arm and leg, whatever they pulled them toward the ovens. But small children were laying there. He walked through the dead bodies, through the corpses, and he picked up small children. And every one he picked up was just like a limp. And he'd kiss every one of the children, and he'd recite the Kaddish. I could see his lips moving, and he walked to the ovens, laid it on top of another prisoner, and then shoved it into the fire. One after the other, after the third, but every one had Kaddish said after him. Those of you who want to close your ears, the next section is even harder than the previous ones. Did you look into the ovens? Itzkowitz was asked, have you ever seen what a body looks like when the fire hits it? This is most broad curling fire, the arms and the legs, the head rise where the flame hits the dead body. The muscles relax, the arms and legs and head, do you believe that a minute the corpses are coming back to life? Then all of a sudden the skin starts to peel just like the bark on the birch tree falling off, and the stench is horrendous. His description of the dead is matched by a very different source, one who witnessed the only other person who bore witness to what happened at Belgitz, and that was Kurt Gerstein. Kurt Gerstein was at once a perpetrator, an invaluable witness giving valuable information to the West about the Nazi killing centers why there was still time to save the victims. He deliberately took the job as a Christian resistance figure. He deliberately took the job, think of how compromised we're about to hear him, as the head of the technical disinfection department of the Waffen SS. He worked directly with Zyklon B. He justified his continuing participation in the killing by the secret information he passed on to the West. If anybody lived in the gray zone, it was Gerstein, whose career has been powerfully depicted in Shaw Friedlander's Kurt Gerstein, The Ambiguity of the Good. In August 1942, he visited Aksion Reinhardt camps of Treblinka, Sobobor, and Belgians. Thereafter, he made contact with neutral diplomats from Sweden and with the Vatican with members of the Dutch underground and a bishop of anti-German confessing, anti-Nazi German confessing church. He told them what he saw, and one of the first documents I would look at if I got access to the Vatican archives is the report from the papal nuncio from Berlin as to his conversation with Kurt Gerstein as to the question of what did the Vatican know and when did the Vatican know it. He died in prison in 1945, apparently by suicide, but in actuality, it's more likely that fellow SS officers may have murdered him. His testimony is now an invaluable insight into Belgitz. He was ineffective in halting the killing, not because he didn't speak, but because the Pope people to whom he spoke did not listen. Some Jewish workers on the far side, this is his description. Some Jewish workers on the far side opened the wooden doors. Inside, the people were still standing erect, like pillars of basalt, since there was not an inch of space for them to fall or even lean in. Families could still be seen holding hands even in death. It was a tough job to separate them as the chambers were emptied to make way for the next batch. The bodies were tossed out blue, wet with sweat and urines, the legs soiled with feces and menstrual blood. A couple of dozen workers checked out the mouths of the dead, which they tore open with iron hooks, gold to the left, other objects to the right. 
Unlike mm. ordinary prisoners in Auschwitz, Zunder commandos did not suffer from hunger. Their food was ordinary concentration camp provisions, but it was supplemented by the food that they could scavenge from newly arrived transports. Arriving prisoners brought with them food on the trains, food that was reflected what was eaten in their native lands. Polish Zunder commando ate olives and dates when Greek Jews arrived. Some Jews arriving on the eve of Passover even bought matzahs. Transport of Polish Jews, however, arrived without provisions, we were told. The explanation may be very simple. Ghettoized Polish Jews were already starving before deportation. They had no food to bring with them. They slept on mattresses in heated bunks on t built on top of the ovens. They wore civilian clothes. And they wore civilian clothes because they were so close to death that even the SS did not want to go near them. Some carried knives as they were not searched, although they had road calls and had to follow a rigorous routine. The Germans seemed to have left them mostly alone. Some participated in the resistance. A crematoria was set on fire on October 1944, just before the gassing at Auschwitz was halted. Some of the Zunder Commando were Greek Jews who arrived in 1943. Now, Greek Jews are unique among the prisoners because they shared no common language with the other prisoners. So I say that Greek Jews give you the most visually interesting testimonies of the Holocaust because they were like deaf people. All they had in deaf people, deaf people you understand, compensate for the loss of hearing by their capacity of seeing. So Greek Jews had no common language, therefore they also could not inform the people of what was happening. They couldn't talk, but they surely could see. How did people behave in the moments before their deaths? Joseph Sacker, a Greek Jew who arrived in Auschwitz on the eve of Passover, reports children behaved like children looking for their parents' hands. Parents embraced their children. Children did not know anything. What did people say inside the gas chamber? Shlomo Dragon, one of two brothers who worked as under commando, said, people called one another by name. Mothers called children, children their mothers and fathers. Sometimes we could hear Shema Yisrael, hear O Israel, Lord our God, the Lord is one. The traditional line recited by Jews of death. Rudolf Redder said, I heard the sliding doors moaning and screaming, desperate calls in Polish and Yiddish blood-curling screams. All that lasted for 15 minutes, screams of children and women, and finally, one common, continuous, horrible scream. All that lasted for 15 minutes. The machine ran for 20 minutes. <coughs> and after 20 minutes, there was silence. Death took on a routine character, the monotony of a daily assignment, but not always. When death was individualized, it was recalled vividly. Stalin once said, the death of millions of people is a statistic. The death of one person can be a, a tragedy. Sam Itzkowitz recalled such a death. Tuvia Siegel was working with the Zunder Commando. His job was to carry out the clothes from the victims once they were undressed. Bess Platka was there in the undressing room being undressed. Tobias walked up to her and started talking, taking her clothes. She said to him, Tobias, what are you doing here? I'm going to come out and I'm going to want my clothes. He said, you won't need it in the next five minutes. You'll be dead. Well, she got hysterical. She went berserk. As she took her panties off, she threw them in the SS man's face and called him, you murderer. He tried to get her to shut it up. He pulled out his gun and tried to pistol whisk her while he was pistol whipping her. She said, you're not going to kill my child. I gave it life and I'm going to take its life. She choked her baby to death, threw the baby in his face. 
She reached and she had a big European beer bottle with very thick, heavy glass. And she got one of those bottles. She didn't have any beer. It was a bottle with water. She grabbed the bottle. She hit him over the head with the bottle and knocked the bastard out. As he fell to the ground, she grabbed his gun and emptied the whole chamber into him. Blood flying all over the place, and the guards outside came in and shot everyone who didn't want to go into the gas chamber. When they saw her body, the SS officer Schillinger, together with Wunderzunder Commando, um, commented, we had genuine joy at his death. In the undressing room, people asked where to go after the showers. What were the Germans' plans for them? Ordinary questions, always the same, is the way one witness described him. Another got in annoyed by the interviewer. What did you say? He answered sharply. How, what could we say? Some of the victims understood what was about to happen. Others went to death still not knowing, still not comprehending the destructive process. One feels the abject powerlessness of the Zunder Commando in these situations. They knew more directly, more clearly than anyone, how vast and murderous were the killers. There was nothing they could do. Only later, at Treblinka Sobobor, and at least according to one possible report at Belzhitz and at Auschwitz, the Zunder Commando engaged in armed uprising. The Nazis had a macabre sense of humor, or a macabre sense about them, because one of the other remarkable things that they all point out is throughout the aftermath of the gassing process, the orchestra played. The orchestra played on and on and on. Let me take you for about three more minutes into a more complete version of um, Rudder's testimony because I think it's going to give you a sense of what the entire process was like. About noon, the train arrived at Belgitz. It was a small station surrounded by small houses at the Belgitz train station. The train moving from the main line, on, main line onto the siding about one kilometer long led straight into, death, into the gate of the death camp. The area between Belgitz and the camp was surrounded by SS men. <coughs> no one was allowed in. Civilian people were shot if they happened to wander in. A moment later, the receiving of the train began. Dozens of SS men would open the wagon saying, Los, los, get out! With whips and their rifle butts, they pushed the people out. The doors of the wagon were a meter or more above the ground. Driven out by whips, the people had to jump down. Everybody, old and young, many broke their arms and legs falling down. They had to jump down to the ground. The children were mangled in bedlam everyone pouring out, dirty, exhausted, terrified. The sick, the old, the young, the tiny children, those who could not walk on their own, were put into stretchers and dumped at the edge of a huge dugout pits, their graves. There the Gestapo man, Ehrman, shot them, pushed their bodies into the graves with rifle butts. You have to know that at each camp, um, the Nazis observed um, what we call in America the Americans with Disability Act. They had equal access for those who were disabled. So you had the Lazarette at Treblinka, you had this, and at Auschwitz, in the back of the um, crematoria area, those who could not walk into the gas chamber were shot directly and then passed into the ovens. So they made sure that everybody, whether they could walk or not walk, got equal treatment. Equal, you understand. Tall, handsome, dark-haired, looking like any normal man. He lived in Belgitz in a small house next to the station, alone like the others, without a family and without women. Immediately after the victims were unloaded, they were gathered in the courtyard surrounded by armed Oscars for Ehrman to give a speech. 
The silence was deadly. He stood close to the crowd. Everybody wanted to hear. Suddenly there was hope. If they talk to us, maybe they want us to live. Maybe there will be work. Maybe. Ehrman talked loud to clear. You're going now bathe. Later you'll be sent to work. That's all. Everybody was glad, happy. After all, we'll be working. I said they'll even be even applauded. The men ran straight to a building with a sign, Bad Nan Halas Drama, bath and inhalation rooms. The women proceeded 20 meters to a large barracks, 30 by 15, to have their sheds shaved. They entered quietly, not knowing what to expect. Silence was everywhere. Later, I learned that after a few minutes, they were made to line up and sit on wooden stools. The barbers shaved them. After that, they had no doubts. Everybody, young and old, women and children, went to a certain death. Little girls with long hair herded into the shaving barracks. Those without it, uh, with short hair, went directly with the men. Suddenly, without even a transition from hope to despair, came to the realization there was no hope. Women began to scream. They became hysterical, crazed. I was chosen to be one of the workers. I would stand on the side of the courtyard with my group of grave diggers and look at my brothers and sisters, friends and acquaintances heard and tore death. While the women were rounded up naked and shaved, whipped like cattle in the slaughterhouse, the men were already dying in the gas chamber. It took two hours to shave the women, two hours more to murder them. Many SS men using whips and sharp bayonets puts the women toward the building. The Oscars counted out 750 persons per chamber. I heard the noise of sliding doors, moaning, murning, and screaming. Desperate calls in Polish, Yiddish, blood curling screams, all that lasted for 15 minutes. Screams of children, women, and finally one common, continuous, horrible scream. All that lasted for 15 minutes. The machines ran for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, there was silence. The Oscars pulled the open, the oven, the doors on the opposite side of the chamber, which led to the outdoors, and we then began our assignment. We dragged bodies of people who minutes ago were alive. We dragged them using leather straps and used prepared mass graves. And the orchestra played. It played from morning till night. The Jews were arriving from everywhere, Jews and only Jews. And the Action Reinhardt camps were unique because the victims of the Action Reinhardt camps were uniquely Jews. Let's look at one figure that is startling and extraordinary. 500,000 Jews were killed at Belgiots in 10 months. A month and a half of that was used to rebuild the gas chambers. Staff of Belgians was 104, of whom 14 were Germans. 90 of them were Ukrainian. Treblinka, 900,000 more or less Jews were killed in a 13-month period. The staff of Treblinka was 120, of whom 30 were SS. Consequently, and this is what gives the Holocaust again in its murderous gas chamber sage, it's a process, and it's a process of essentially a factory process, an assembly line process. I spoke today to one of the classes and I said that essentially, instead of sending mobile killers to stationary victims when it became later in the process, the Nazis made the victims mobile by railroad cars, and they sent them to stationary factories of death. 30 and 14, 44 SS personnel were responsible for the murder of approximately 1.4 million Jews. It's a Herculean assignment of tremendous logistics. Those of you who have witnessed the March of the Living or who have sent children on the March of the Living have to look. Last year we had a march of 12,000 people. And I looked back about a mile, a mile and a quarter of the march, and I said to my wife, I said, it scares the hell out of me because that was one day in the life of Auschwitz. And the idea of what a Herculean logistics task it was, etc. 
The Jews were arriving, let's conclude his testimony, and then we'll take questions. The Jews were arriving from everywhere, Jews and only Jews. With each transport, it was the same as the one I arrived on. People were told to undress, leave their things in the courtyard. Erdman always gave the same speech, everything the same. People always showed a spark of hope in their eyes that they're going to work. But second later, babies were torn from their mothers. The old and the sick were thrown on stretchers, uh, stretchers, and the men, little boys and girls were pushed with rifle butts further down the press. The storeroom for hair, underwear, and clothing of the victims in the gas chamber was located in a separate, rather small barracks. Hair was collected for 10 days. Barracks were filled with gold teeth. Because part of what you have to understand, essentially, is that in this case, the human being was regarded as a consumable raw material to be discarded in the process, but whatever was valuable of the human being was recycled. Gold, hair, because hair could serve as a detonator. And to give you again a sense of the figures, when Auschwitz was liberated, there were seven tons of human hair that the Soviets discovered. And that was only the shipment for a brief period of time. And there was no evidence that human beings were made into soap. But part of the reason may have been that it was not financially feasible because there was so little fat on some of these human beings. And every bar of soap that we got at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, we had sent for testing. And none of them came up with any human remains, though the survivors clearly believe that the human beings were made of soap. And the Israelis negatively referred to survivors in the early years as sabonikim, as soaps, as if they were made into soap. Suffice it to say, and with this I'll conclude, that these people offer a rare testimony, an extraordinarily valuable testimony, about the core, the closest we can come to being there. And we have to respect it, we have to listen attentively to it, and we have to have it shake our own humanity. Thank you very much. Let's take questions. Can you handle that? Absolutely. Good. Okay, we'll give you a moment to absorb and then we'll take questions. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, you mentioned Son of Saul, and I'm just uh, wondering what you actually thought of that particular verse. Very good question, very important question. Let me say two things about the movie. The first I want to talk about is cinemagraphic. The director did something absolutely brilliant, which is he never allowed you to see what Saul himself did not see. And that is that part of what makes the film so bloody irritating, especially at the beginning, is because he never uses anything that is not from Saul's perspective. And that's one of the reasons why if you've had a drink before, you think you're nauseous and the like. But it's a technique which says we're going to see it from the perspective of Saul. Secondly, uh, there's a plot flaw. And I don't mean this pejoratively. The plot flaw is we understand that um, you don't need a rabbi to bury. Thirdly, and very importantly, which is that the idea that somebody came out of the gas chain. One of the things we discover, which is also very interesting, is, and this is the way in which you interpret the notion of people standing on each other, is if gas is going, what does gas do biologically? Gas rises. What is the safest place to be? On the floor. What is the human instinct? To climb up. 
So the idea of, for example, of people climbing on each other and standing as a pillar of salt tells you that in essence, the instinct to rise goes against whatever knowledge you have about that. Consequently, um, in the normal course of events, somebody who escapes the gas chamber alive would never be touched. A hangman, when the noose breaks or something like that, the person is never hung. Someone who has military, you know, who's facing a, a military thing is never, um, 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 you know, a, a, a shooting. Uh, and it's not killed, it's never done that. And one of the things we had in America, which was uh, very interesting, which is we had a killing by uh, injection which failed, and the horror was not by the killing of injection, but by the fact that they had to continue and do it a second time, which violated the norm. The second part of Son of Saul, <coughs> and believe me, I know this from the film side of it, is that everybody wants in Hollywood a happy ending. And for a moment, I thought he was going to cop out. And the cop out was going to be that these people were either going to survive, or the other cop out or the other problem was either the young boy was going to betray them, in which case you would have felt like cutting your throat. Instead, the young boy is left alone and these people are killed. And consequently, the entire effort was for naught. One of the most important things to understand is that he brought us very close to that. There was another film years ago on the Zunder Commando called The Grey Zone. And the problem with the gray zone is the problem of anybody doing a film on Zunder Commando, which I showed you in one sense, which is for a film to work, there has to be a personal story, a human story. These people felt of themselves that they were automatons. They were not human. Automatons don't have a narrative. So the gray zone essentially failed as a movie precisely because it remained faithful to history and didn't give them a real personality. Son of Saul used this interesting device of the decision to individualize a death to bury a child as a way to give the narrative a personality which gave you a stake in the experience. And that's one of the reasons why it won what it won. And we Jews should have a little bit of, um, uh, what shall we say, um, it's a, a certain sense sometimes of Yiddish in a comma, that the anti-Semitic uh, government in Hungary that is trying to rewrite the Holocaust narrative to exclude the Hungarians now has the embarrassment that a Hungarian film wins the Academy Award to their anguish, it is a Hungarian film on what? On, on death, and the people will soon ask, how did the Hungarians get there? And that, again, is the story of 1944. Other questions? I promise you shorter answers. Yes, sir. Um, you raised, right at the end of your talk, you said this talks about something about humanity. And I wonder if you could be a bit more specific in terms of what you think this event says about the human capacity for suffering and anguish, and also about the human capacity for cruelty and violence. I spent a, a lot of my early time trying to deal with the experience of the victims. And increasingly, I have been intrigued by the question, not so much of the personal nature of the evil, but the structure of evil, the processes of evil. And part of what is intriguing to me, first of all, there is an infinite human capacity for evil. And we've seen it. There is a marvelous capacity of some people for good, and there's also the capacity of the human being to grapple with their circumstances 
and to deal with their compromised existence, some with integrity and some being compromised. And again, one of the things we've seen in the life of survivors, which has given them their unique moral stature, is two things. Number one, survivors have come to define two things. They've come, first of all, to define resilience, coming back from what they saw, from what they experienced. And especially when we teach the Holocaust, for example, in American inner cities, lots of kids say if they could become what they were afterwards, then I can make something of my life. Mm -hmm. And they become symbols of what they didn't think of themselves. They become symbols of quasi-heroism. Now let me say something theologically about what the Jews have done with the Holocaust. You didn't ask, but I might as well get it in. <coughs> we have taken a particular story, borne witness to it, and made it the universal emblem of human anguish and human suffering and human cruelty and human evil. Jews have done that before. What is the fundamental Jewish narrative? It's the biblical narrative of the Exodus, which says essentially by making it a universal story, virtually anybody who's exposed to Western civilization knows the word Pharaoh in Egypt looks for the question of Moses and sees the question of how does one get through the sea and what the journey through the desert is to the promised land. And if you want to have a Passover Seder, you ask three very simple questions, not four. Ask somebody, what is their Pharaoh? Who is their Moses? And what is their promised land? And you'll be surprised by the nature of the discussion. What are we doing with the Holocaust? And this is where survivors have borne witness and consequently they're saying, and would that it was true, they're saying essentially that we want to salvage something from the ashes, which is testimony in the hopes that if we bear witness, the world can be different. And we've made a particular story universal, which has its own problems because people then say, this is a Holocaust, and that is a Holocaust, and this and that. The other thing, there's trivialization, there's vulgarization, there's a whole range of things. But what we're doing is to say that in the aftermath of evil, you can bear witness in the hopes that essentially it gives you models of human behavior that can counteract this evil and models of resilience that can allow you to come back from even that depth. And that's the narrative of the Jewish people today, at least in the most positive sense. I can go on to other narratives of Jewish people, but that would be a longer conversation that would take you into other spaces. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Can I uh, ask you to speak up a little bit louder? People who are, mo let, let me begin by saying some of the Jews of Salonika refused to become Zunda Commando, not all. And that is, I can name several Jews of Salonika, including a fellow I know very well, Dario Gabay, who um, were Zunder Commandos. The Dragon Brothers, etc., etc., were also Zunder Commandos. They were from Salonika and the like. So, to those who refused Kolokovod, our hats have to go off to them. That's a deep and a profound moral statement and uh, the like. The second um, thing is 
The Nazis themselves were most surprised that Zunder Commando were still alive. They were not supposed to live. They were supposed to be slaughtered at the end of 60 or 90 days, and new group came in. And essentially, they were most surprised that there were people who were still alive who could do that, especially when they were in a position later on to bear witness and to testify. So they were not supposed to live. They were destined to die. And that's why they even appear differently than other prisoners. And one of the things that you had when the Zunder Commando had the uprising, one of the things they got into was prisoner uniforms. In other words, some who escaped got into prisoner uniforms. And the other Zunder Commando who survived were the Zunder Commando of um, Sobor and Treblinka that, again, escaped and then had to go and find places in which the Poles um, uh, in the vicinity would hide them and take care of them. And they were clearly visible as, um, clearly visible as, um, you know, prisoners of, of, of the camp. But remember, even in the survivors of, uh, who escaped from Treblinka and Sobobor, <coughs> many of them were not Zunder commandos. Many of them were working in the equivalent in, in Treblinka and Belgia, uh, and Sobobor of what was Canada. Many of them were sorters. Many of them were, um, uh, people who were jewelers and who uh, collected gold and had certain skills that the Nazis wanted in order to um, in order to um, process all of these people. It's the people who worked in the vicinity of the gas chambers that became uh, in this paper became interesting. I just did a film. <coughs> Uh, that was hijacked, but I don't mean that negatively, I mean that positively, which is I wrote a, I can say it because it's not, I wrote an absolutely brilliant script for a film on Treblinka, and then we interviewed a survivor by the name of Samuel Willenberg, and he was much better than anything I could write. So what we did, which was wonderful, is sometimes it takes talent to recognize talent and get out of the way. And we let him speak to we let him speak to the audience. He died this um, uh, uh, this um, um, American winter. He died in about February, <coughs> but he was not a Zunder commando. He was there in one of the building uh, components, but essential to the uh, essential to the camp. And his testimony, but he s never went into the area of the gas chambers. That was forbidden territory even for him. What made, uh, again, Redder more intriguing was he could be everywhere because of his role. He had, as it were, a, an all, you know, an all zone pass. And gas chambers were always located behind their own particular barbed wire and behind their own particular ways uh, in which they were confined. Now, Auschwitz was a little bit different because two of the gas chambers at Auschwitz, people had to walk by. And that is, you know, if you go to the end of the line, you see uh, gas chamber number two and number three, and you walk by it, and you can see it, as it were, and that was part of the intimidation process. But what went on inside was not particularly known. Other questions? Yes. The answer is yes, um, some married, uh, some had children, some lived lives in which they never expressed what they did, some only bore witness much later, um, some led normal, ordinary lives, and some of them later on were consumed by what they had repressed. You don't have to be a Freudian to talk about the return of the repressed. And you also don't need to be a Freudian to understand how much effort it takes to repress. So they led 
different types of lives, depending where. And the one I know best, Dario Gabay, uh, is now 94 years old. And prior to, you know, next four years ago was weightlifting and heavily into body training. And uh, I run three miles a day and he could outrun me till his 88th year. Uh, and, you know, he's now much time catches up with everyone. And I wouldn't say that's the type of shape he's in. Let's do one more thing, which is the way I like to conclude which is you will all raise your hands who still have questions, and I will give you one answer. But raise, if you have questions to ask, let's go around. Sir? More general question. might be a bit naive. But just to understand the war machine and how the Nazis went about, the nine million Jews in Europe, how were they able to identify six million people so quickly and exterminate them? Okay. Any other questions on this side of the room? Conrad. Why only males? Okay. Any questions on this side of the room? Yes, sir. Uh, when I visited Auschwitz, I was surprised to see that big barns with the things you mentioned with hair, the suitcases of the last train load, all the artificial limbs and so on. Is that maintained by Jewish organizations or German? Okay, let's go to the, th the um, four questions. Um, number one, how were they able to identify it? The answer is a variety of ways. Uh, some of them were composed uh, by lists of the Jewish community. In the early days, for example, you had a, a Germany is intriguing because Germany began to define the Germany began an anti-Semitic um, uh, range of activities, but they had a legal problem, which is they were targeting Jews, but they had no definition of Jews. Therefore, in 1935, they came to a definition of Jews, which is the Nuremberg Laws, based on the religion of your grandparents. That already did, and that's intriguing again because it means it's not based on the identity you affirm, on the traditions you revere, on the history you embrace, on the religion you practice. It's based on who your grandparents are. It also ironically got the churches involved because let's assume you were defined as a Jew but you thought you were Christian. How do you find out who your grandparents are? The answer is you have to go through church baptismal records. They developed family researchers and they developed family courts to get away from the pejorative dish definition of Jews. In other places, they used Jewish community roles. In other places, Jews were identifiable to the general population. There were all sorts of people in Poland, for example, who were people who betrayed and turned in their neighbors. And Jews were uh, reasonably readily identifiable. Uh, different today, um, where Jewish is much more convoluted. I, I give you an example. I work with two people, Patrick Gallagher and Amy Goldberg. Patrick Gallagher is Jewish and Amy Goldberg is not. <laughs> and in fact, uh, in America at least, one of the methodologies of um, Population survey used to be percentages of standard Jewish names. No longer applicable. You know, for every Cohn, Friedman, et cetera, et cetera. So the answer is you used multiple ways of identification. And very often the local population was responsible for identification. One other example in Germany, in the early years, which is quite intriguing, is the Christian churches protested on behalf of people whom they regarded as baptized Christians whom the state regarded as Jews. But that meant when they protested that they sort of had already agreed that Jews qua Jews were defined differently. Let's go now to the um, question of the material at Auschwitz. How many of you have been to Auschwitz? 
Let me tell you, uh, number one, it's an enormously powerful experience. But there's a profound problem at Auschwitz which is not going to be resolved even in its new iteration. The most powerful aspects of Auschwitz, one, Auschwitz was three camps in one. Auschwitz I, Auschwitz II, which is Birkenau, Auschwitz III, which is Bunomanovitz. Bunomanovitz, just to give you an example, was a slave labor camp in which German corporations invested 700 million Reichsmarks in 1942, which was $400 million then which is the equivalent of about 20 times that today, so about $9 billion in the factories around um, uh, Auschwitz because they essentially invested on the idea of slave labor. And slave labor was here to stay. The Jews were to be the first, not the last. There's a problem with Auschwitz. The problem is that the most powerful artifacts in Auschwitz I come from Auschwitz II. And the entire interpretive, uh, uh, the entire interpretive, uh, uh, interpretive efforts that you see in Auschwitz I really describe the process as Auschwitz II. The suitcases come from Auschwitz II. The hair comes from Auschwitz II. The shoes come from Auschwitz II. The talesim come from Auschwitz II. The prosthesis come from Auschwitz II. And even the marvelous um, uh, sculptural diagram of the crematoria B2 by Stobiarski is a description of what you see in reality at Auschwitz II, not at Auschwitz I. There's a second flaw in Auschwitz, which is that Auschwitz itself was created during Soviet times. And when it was created during Soviet times, the Soviet Union interpreted what they were doing not as referring to that three-letter word that you can't say publicly, which is J-E-W, but they interpreted the killing process as killing people of a certain nationality. So the pavilions are all national pavilions, but the reality is the Netherlands, people from the Netherlands were not killed. Jews from the Netherlands were killed. People from Hungary were not killed. The Jews of Hungary were deported to Auschwitz, but the organizing principle of Auschwitz are pavilions of national pavilions, and they've been trying to gradually morph into something else, and even the Jews have fallen victim to that because one of the most powerful pavilions at Auschwitz is the Jewish pavilion. And the problem with the Jewish pavilion is they all were Jews. 90% of all the people who died at Auschwitz were Jews. The group closest to them were the Roma and Sinti, who were the only other inhabitants, along with some Soviet POWs, of the gas chambers. And the pavilions are all organized on national basis. Now, who maintains that? And I understand you're a collector, so I'm going to take a, lo a, a little bit of a longer um, There is a state museum at Auschwitz that is under the control of the Polish government, which now is an enormously important asset to the Polish government because about 1,500,000 people visit Auschwitz each year. And I don't have to tell you what that means in terms of tourism and in terms of the importance of, of Auschwitz as an economic driving force. Interestingly enough, most people do not sleep in Auschwitz. They sleep in Krakow because you don't want to sleep in Auschwitz. You want to get the hell out of there. I slept, I, I've been to Auschwitz probably 50 times. I slept for the first time in Auschwitz because I was doing work that took a, a long time. And I'll tell you the truth, I did not have a good night's sleep. And we had a law, a rule in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum that you are now allowed to bill us for liquor when you traveled with the exception of if you were visiting camp and then you had an unlimited expense account for drinking liquor. And for good reason, because you need to consume something to get rid of that thing. 
Last point, which is why males, because essentially, um, let's first of all remind ourselves that women also were perpetrators. And our good friend Ren Wendy Lauer did very important work about women uh, perpetrators. There's also a very interesting album called the Hucker album, which is the equivalent of the um, Auschwitz album, except if the Auschwitz al album is women, uh, is prisoners arriving at Auschwitz in 1944, the Hucker album are SS at play about what the SS did in their off hours, and there were plenty of women there and I leave it to your imagination what young men and young women did to uh, rid themselves psychologically um, of what they were doing in their off hours, but um, uh, of what they were doing in their work hours, but uh, they did, they did uh, that. Why men for this? Because the Germans probably regarded, and the SS probably regarded as the work as unfitting for the delicate character. They were male chauvinist pigs, as most of us were, but they regarded it as unfitting for the delicate character of women. But women worked, and they were present throughout um, Birkenau, and they served at couples, they served in barracks, et cetera, et cetera. So we can't left, let women off the hook, but Zunderkommando are men. Thank you very much. I think it must be said that we deal with this subject every day. We're a Holocaust museum. We've had a lot of speakers, and I think seldom has it been brought home to us as vividly and as harshly 